Good day, Sebastian. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, you and I met exactly one year ago today, October 6th, when we were doing the David James and my uh, Pivot to Performance uh, video series last year. And I, and I was really intrigued with what you were doing and how you were thinking about this. And so I had made a mental note or a physical note <laughs> at that time to include you in this series because I wanted to share your story and your thinking about the profession learning and development and so that's kind of why we're here so i have a four uh, part question uh intro to this series and i'd like to start with asking you to introduce yourself tell us your name and share with us where you grew up sure um a year ago today i, I think it's been quite profitable for you that guy to be honest with you because I've, I've bought a few of your books since that day so it's a good it's a good way in financially beneficial um so who am I? So I'm, I'm Seb Tindall. I'm the Director of Learning Development at um, Vitality, which is a, a health and life insurance organisation primarily based in the UK. Um, I have been here for about sort of eight years now, um, and I'm actually based in Stockport. The, the office here is, is actually not far from the hospital that I was born. So I've kind of moved around a bit across the UK. You know, I was in the States for a bit. I've come all the way back and I can basically throw a tennis ball at the ward in which I was born in, which is a kind of a nice, a nice circle for me. Well, very good. So uh, tell us uh, where you went to school and what you studied. So I, um, I went to the University of Manchester, again, which is which pretty local. I actually grew up in, in Chester, uh, but, but, but moved um, to Manchester University. And I, I studied environmental economics, um, which, you know, had a heavy slant in microeconomics, to be honest with you, which still to this day, I find absolutely fascinating. I think there's the mix of scientific discipline versus a kind of a strong numbers focus versus an understanding of the sensitivity of ecosystems. You know, all of that learning still influences my thinking today, even in, in the L&D profession. So I think that, that that educational grounding, although seemingly detached, actually, you know, I've, I've really taken with me up, up until this day. Well, very cool. So uh, tell us about your career progression after getting out of school. Um, so... I know I wanted to, do, to, to, to travel a little bit, so I ended up um, playing and coaching some soccer in the States, in Boston, which was fantastic. Had a brilliant time. Um, and then knew I had to, at some point, come back to reality because um, I wasn't good enough at soccer. Um, so I ended up going through your, kind of your typical graduate scheme um, type kind of thing, kind of a selection process. Um, and I ended up going through an assessment in order to try and get to like a finance institution in my head i was like i want to work in finance that's where all the money is it's going to be great you know completely ignorant as you are at that time but that's what i want to go for and i knew that these these kind of programs allow you to kind of sample three months here three months here three months and you kind of get an overview of an organization from within which is quite unique i thought that's going to allow me to choose and really specialize in something that i'm, I'm passionate about and I kind of went into this, this, this assessment and the people who were assessing me kind of went, well, that's great, but we're a third party and want you to come and work for us instead. So I thought, okay, I'll do that for a while. Um, and it was kind of um, hard selling, you know, on the phone, selling training to people, which was, a, was actually a brilliant way of, of learning the, the objections you might get from any stakeholder about introducing training into an organization. And I kind of did that for a period of time, but the, the real breakthrough for me was I kind of turned, I turned around and said, look, it's been three years. I still want to go down that financial route. I want to go to the, into that graduate scheme. And I joined um, Santander, which is a, which is a, a huge bank, huge, huge financial organization. And just did a little bit of rotation for a few months. And their view of the graduate scheme is quite different. And this is, you know, it's, it's relevant to, to the job that I do today. They used to just pick you up and plonk you in an underperforming kind of contact center or region and say, can you turn it around? Can you improve performance? And again, after a couple of successful rounds, I kind of realized that 
this is great, but presumably there's a lot of central themes that you can take from what I'm doing locally here in an area or in a concert centre of 500 people globally. So what are we, how are you scraping what I'm doing into the, into the global um, kind of approach? And they just said, well, we, we do, but it's a relatively siloed approach. I said, well, great. Let, I want to go and work in a central ND function. I love doing this. I love seeing people getting better. It's infectious. People really respond to it. I appear to have some sort of natural flair to it, although very raw at the time and certainly made loads of mistakes. But I might be, I might be quite good at it. How about you give me a shot? You know, put me in that function and let me start working with managers at the point that they're trained, not at the point in which they're kind of struggling to do their job as much. And we can cut out the middleman, the remedial action. Um, and they, they, they were very supportive and just said yeah let's let's give it a go and that that's how i find myself very quickly moving into an L D function and working with some really seasoned experienced professionals and that really helped me understand how little i actually knew which was just really useful um at that point um which is which is a theme i think working with with brilliant people and i I must confess, so I'll stop rubbing on it in a minute, but that is another theme about moving on to another organization, really values that organization, the cooperative bank. And I realized that being a, a, a small part of a huge organization is brilliant because you achieve specialism. But actually, if you can move into an organization where the team is not quite as big, you can be a bit more of a generalist. And that's, that's kind, of, kind of where I want it to be. And again, ended up working with some unbelievable professionals there that I still... I still remember vividly to this day because of the influence they had on my career. So how did you get to where you're at right now? And tell us a little bit about what you are doing right now. So I guess the, the Carp Happen, brilliant, absolutely fell in love with that organization. It was really values led and, and, and driven and purpose driven. And the funny thing about that organization was um, they used a lot of contractors so a lot of people who've been doing the job for such a long period of time and could command pretty handsome daily rates. And then there was me and I was like the consistent and I would sit in this room and you could always tell who was external versus internal because they had a different colour badge. And I remember sitting in this room working with, having a team of people you know, kind of support me in a project, work for me. And they were all contractors. And I was like, into the only internal person and I looked at the situation I thought I damn sure could earn a lot more money than what I'm doing right now but what I won't be able to do is work with some absolutely brilliant professionals and I kind of understood the dynamic of you're not going to learn a lot from me but I can treat you with respect and absolutely make you feel like part of the organization and in return I'm going to learn every single thing I can from all of you people until I annoy you and then that's going to accelerate my career and I remember just sitting with them constantly watching the things that they did going to all of their client meetings all the analysis pieces all the workshops every single thing and just glean everything I physically could until it comes came to the point where you know you, you know you've got to stand on your own two feet and do it yourself. I ended up taking my first D manager role in a in a in a kind of a, a debt resolution organization, um, which was great. Again, small business, only sort of 300, but you own the whole thing. So again, increasingly you're moving into a smaller organization, but you know, you're 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 increasingly responsible for the whole remit of everything that could happen um, there, which was absolutely um, brilliant commercially for the career. Because I think when you're in a small organization, you, you learn more about how the organization is performing. It's not a glossy update. You're literally going to organization updates on a Monday and you know the pounds and pence figures that are in the bank account. And some people love that, some people not so much. And for me, that was a brilliant commercial grounding in Every second we spend away from people's jobs, it's going to cost us money. And you would be reminded of that vividly on a regular basis. And that started to kind of turn my thinking a little bit more to say, you know, conventional L&D is, is, is almost anti-commercial in its thinking. Whereas if you sit in a room with people enough and you know that if we don't stay in the black here, the lights are going to get turned off, you have to start 
thinking in that way. And, I, and I, after a while, I got approached to work at Vitality, um, which was kind of, to be honest, when I, when I first started, I hadn't heard of them. Um, and I joined, there was about three people in the department here um, servicing 2,000 500 people so it's a small department loads of demand not one second of digital learning produced by the team at that point um loads of needs and i just thought you know what this is too good of a blank canvas to turn down you know i can now go and move into a bigger organization loads more demand ready to get complex and really build it from the ground up and that that kind of has happened over the last seven years pretty much um where we've managed to amass some brilliant people um we've learned so much you know we're now at the point where we're 96 percent digital so we've gone through kind of a, a, a transformation in that sense with a lot of the same people so we've learned as we've gone 80 percent of the team have come from frontline roles so they're actually not from an D background but we've you know we've carefully curated a a custom performance-based approach in an organization, which means that um, it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, we're, we're looking for, for substance and stamina. The technical element of LD here in particular, we can teach that might not be true in every organization, but if you're looking for a shot to get started in LD, we've we've made a living of, of doing it partly through necessity. So again, that's that's brought us up to the point where we've scaled the team. It's now 17 people in that sense. And today, I kind of look after my remit, um, any kind of service requirements, any technical change, there's just a lot of change here, a lot of technical servicing needs that happen, anything changes pretty much in the service areas, we're involved in it. Um, and I also look after the IT architecture for the, people, the wider people team as well, just making sure that the systems are conducive to um, getting the wider organizational people data, um, and that we're truly considering um, kind of a desired architecture to make sure that the people experience is right for everyone, both within our team and externally. So it's kind of morphed gradually over the years to get a little bit bigger and a little bit more, um, a little bit different. Well, thank you for that. So I, w I had watched uh, you on a video, you were being interviewed for a different podcast. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to do right now is, can you, share with us a story where you were asked to do some L and D and perhaps it didn't turn out to be quite all L and D and it was maybe looking at the systems or whatever without giving away too much. Can, can you share with our audience uh, one of your war stories? Yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, there, there always comes a moment, I think in a career where you, 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 you flip the switch from, God, I need to learn so much and I don't know very much. And then you kind of go, I kind of know what I'm doing here. And I'm getting a flavor of this is what it's going to be like long term. And I think it, it, at that sort of moment, I remember doing a, a technical rollout and it was about 3,000 people and it was for, um, it was for like a, a new phone system. And it was, it was nuanced as people all over the country and it was, it was difficult, but it's one of those things where we did everything by the book, everything. You know, it was, there's a bit of blended learning thrown in there. So a little bit of e-learning for half an hour. And then you go into a classroom for two hours and then off you pop and there's floor walkers and all that good stuff. And everyone sat there and went, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was great. And I sat in the room and I just thought, no, it wasn't. It was actually, it actually should be so much better than that. And my concern was, we don't, the book says it's great. The stakeholders will turn around, it's great. But in your heart of hearts, you know, that's not what I want to do for the rest of my career. I do not want to be known for doing the same pattern stuff every time and getting away with it. And I think at that juncture, it just started, started me realising that, well, okay, maybe that puts time on your career in L&D. Maybe this is, this is not for you. But before I make that decision, I'm going to see what else is out there in this in this profession who's doing it differently who's doing it better if that resonates that's exactly the road that i'm going to go down and it just pull the thread to start voraciously going out there and seeing well, what what other approaches are you have the standard you learn from some great people you learn from some organizations that you know give you the rubber stamp what's the, what's the reality i think i just spent literally two years 
hoovering material, podcasts, books, anything I could find to find something different because I knew that there had to be something else out there. And lo and behold, I did find something else out there that, that completely resonated with me, that made far more sense to my team, that was a far more kind of risk-suitable, agile, commercially viable approach to doing L&D. And then you have to go through the, the, the self-crisis of realizing you've probably been doing it wrong for about six years. <laughs> you have to start again. Yeah. Yeah, you have to start again. But that that for me is when you you realize that if you could get away with doing things that people would give you plaudits for, but you in, in your head you know it should be done better, that was the absolute pivot point for me a number of years ago and just thought, this is if I'm gonna make a living, I'm gonna to have to be proud of it. And at the moment, doing it in traditional ways is not giving me the pride because I know it's flawed. Well, thank you. Um, let me switch gears here a little bit. Uh, this, my series here is HPT videos, human performance technology, also known as human performance improvement or performance improvement or performance technology, a bunch of different names uh, by different organizations over the decades. Yeah. But were you exposed to this kind of formally or did you come across this somehow or what label do you give to this whole notion of being performance-based or performance-oriented? So performance consulting is, is, is how, I, how I know it here, or how we position it here. And I think the consulting element is a, key, is a key part of it, is almost a third party that can come in with a holistic view of what's going to support somebody to be able to do their job in the best way possible. You know, and that, that's the kind of lens that we try and take here. But I, I guess what, what I did was I read, I read a few books. I'd heard a couple of people speaking. But the one that was the, the penny drop moment for me was listening to um, David James' podcast, the Learning Development uh, Learning podcast, which obviously I know you know David really well. I remember sitting, listening to him um, and just going, God, this guy is brilliant. He just makes so much sense in, in the way that he's incredibly passionate. But the most important thing about him is he's done it. There are so many people who talk about performance consulting right now out there on podcasts who've never done it. They just say, oh, I get it. I get the concept. It's great. Let me talk to everyone about performance consulting. They've got no stories or performance metrics to share because they, they might begin the pivot, but they've not done it. David's very different. He's worked in some global organizations. He's, he had the humility to turn around and say, I was doing it wrong and now I'm doing it right, which, which resonates with someone like me because it's absolutely true. He's brilliant at articulating why it's such a sustainable approach. And I remember I just listening to, to, to this one podcast that he did with Bob Mosher. Again, Bob, absolutely brilliant articulating this stuff. And we're just talking about, of course you don't, I'm obviously paraphrasing horribly and I'd recommend that anybody go listen to that podcast if they can do. Of course people don't remember everything. But why would you assume that they know everything? So when you go into a classroom, you, you're going to forget the majority of it. And then what are you left with? Well, you're left with an imperfect memory and you're going to fend for yourself. So why are, you, why are we focusing on the, the formal intervention? Spend your time getting so good at what happens after. So when you're trying to do it, that you can scale back the formality and ideally... The best form of training is no training. And it's getting into that mindset of going, well, hold on a minute. Like that, that is the absolute antithesis of everything you're taught. You know, you sit there, and we've all been there, and you go, oh, we're going to do a, a two-hour communication workshop, and I'm going to get my flip chart up, and there's going to be cake and pens, and everyone's going to say it's great. And then you're just like, hold on a minute. That... You, you can you can understand that even more fundamentally that approach is, is flawed, and then you you can just go through some some basic scientific truths about how we how we learn, and it, all you only got to do is get past the first two or three to realise that the standard approach to commercial ideas is fundamentally flawed based on what we've known for hundreds of years. So why how are we in this situation where there is an accepted norm? that we sit people en masse and go through synchronous training. It's absolutely, um, it's absolutely mind boggling, but you, you understand that, you know, you, you learn from people and, and there's an emulation and you copy, 
and that's become endemic sometimes in some organisations. Not not to, not to damn the profession. I love the profession. It's a brilliant people out there. It really is far far better than I. But at the same time, you realise that we've all been guilty of this on occasion, and you've got to question what you do every single day. Yeah. So true. Uh, let me switch gears here and uh, follow on to what you were talking about here, because you mentioned Bob Mosier. I happen to have been on a Zoom call with him yesterday with somebody yeah. else. But uh, and he's he's fabulous. And his, and his business partner, uh, Conrad Godfordson, yeah. uh, they've got a, a great thing here, uh, this uh, five moments of need. But can you share with us when you first got into L&D, were there any people or books or articles that had a major impact on you that you would like to share with our audience uh, so that perhaps they may follow up and, and pursue those as uh, resources for them? Um, so I know that, that there's, there's a few. I mean, Gloria Gary obviously had, had the early versions of this. You know, performance consulting and performance support are nothing new. They, they've been around for sort of 20, 30 years. And I got Glory Gary's book, and then I read a number of, of other associated books, which, which were talking about this concept of kind of EPSS, like performance systems, and in the flow of work and all that sort of thing. So you, you can quite easily get those. But probably the one that I found most beneficial, Con uh, Bob actually wrote a book, which was um, Innovative Performance Systems. I believe, which I think you can get on Amazon, you know, whatever it is, 20, 20 pounds. And in there, it starts to deal, detail some of the practicalities. And that's the difference, you know, that, that was the main challenge that I, I see probably in the industry today is, unless you've done it, you, 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 you're probably not in a place to talk about it. So talk about the methodologies and the things that you've introduced. And it's the irony about performance support in general, isn't it? It's like, all the learning you will do is theoretical until you actually come to do it. And that's when you will, you will learn far more. It's in the doing that's the challenge. So it's those people that have established their own frameworks. And that, that book for me was great because it starts to talk about those conversations that you have to get really good at the nuance that actually shouldn't be nuanced. You want population A to do something different. Okay, you want them to do this. exactly. Tell me the steps in which they've got to follow to do that. Okay, brilliant. Go through that process. It's the most simple, fundamental conversation, but actually very few professionals do it. A lot of the time you see it, was guilty of myself. Right, you know, communication is perceived not to be good enough. We've done some analysis. We know communication is a problem. So you probably see proficient analysis, but, you know, we know it's a problem. Okay, well, let's come back to you with, here's some brilliant communication principles. No. Where's that coming from? How have you gone from here to there? Tell me exactly how you want people to communicate. Step by step is exactly what they need to do. Forget what they need to know. I'm not interested. Tell me what they need to do, because if it doesn't influence what they do, it was pointless in the first place. So really breaking down your own processes and going, right, in my organization, people are time poor. They are not going to sit in a room for nine hours and figure out step by step. OK, what can we do in an hour? What's going to cut through the ambiguity in the space of an hour? That's what you want people to start thinking about. So it's okay to go and have a look at some of those task analysis processes, which are, you know, um, e-learning practitioner processes of old. A lot of this stuff has existed for many years. But that, that was such a brilliant book in sort of going, okay, well, basically, here's how you can do it if you want to. I think that, for me, allowed me to go, I'm going to take this framework, I'm going to take what works for me, we're going to make it relevant to our team. We're going to make tweaks and amendments, et cetera, et cetera. And this is our customer approach because what works here, I'm completely and acutely aware of the fact if I go to the organization, I might have to completely redesign it and do it differently. That's the exciting thing about the job. It's what works here. It might not work anywhere else. Very good. Thank you. Let me switch gears here slightly. So if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, I often set this up saying you're at a garden party in your neighborhood and you've got new neighbors and they come up to you and they say, Seb, what do you do? What would your 30 second elevator speech be? Now, let me tell you, I've, I've been married to my wife for five years and she couldn't tell you what I do for a living still, still to this day. Um, I, I would say, and not to be too cryptic, that 
and catalyze individual and organizational performance. It's, it's a carefully selected word, catalyze, and I'll, I'll explain. I'll assume I'm off the 30 second clock and I've moved on in the garden party, but I'll explain why, why the thought process is there. One of the biggest realizations probably for me is that people will get better at their jobs without you. Whether l and exists or not, they will get better. An organization will improve whether you're there or not. People will get trained whether you're there or not. They'll resolve work-based issues whether you're there or not. You're there to improve all those processes. You're there to improve the speed at which someone reaches that competence and performance level. You're there to help the organization get better, quicker. That's the purpose. A lot of people will decry when organizations get rid of the whole L&D department. Well, they don't go bankrupt when they do it. Now, we, I sit there and I, I believe it's an incredibly important profession. It's one of the most important professions in the world. But what you can't be blind to the fact is people will be learning when you're not there also. So you just have to be, you have to bring the, the expertise that allow people to get the very best out of themselves in the shortest period of time possible because they're already practicing that stuff themselves. I think for me, that's the best way I can explain it is a catalyst. You're not responsible because you can't be responsible for learning. It's an absolute misnomer. You're also not solely responsible for anybody doing any learning, but you can absolutely catalyze that process by being very deliberate and scientific in terms of what you do. Yes, thank you. Great, great. Uh, a little bit over the 30 seconds, but yes, it was very oh, good. Oh, no. It's, it's <laughs> an informal garden party guy, you know, there's pins exactly. to play. You have a beer in your hand and, you know, nobody's nobody's uh, got a stopwatch. <laughs> um, as, a, as a lifelong learner, where are you currently focused? What are you trying deliberately to learn right now? And and how are you sharing that uh, in your own organization or with others? So I think I'm quite prone to looking at things and trying to push them to the absolute nth degree until you have to do it completely different. You kind of squeeze the whole juice out of the lemon until you go, that's done, I need to do it differently. We need to, we need to think about something else. So I think the place I'm at the moment is if we, if we, if we make the definition of, of performance is the ability of someone to do their job or to complete a given task. I'm quite binary and, and kind of robotic in the way of things I look at that. I'm not advocating, I'm just saying it's the way I'm wired and that's that's how I how I think. A, a lot of my my role I perceive where is trying to eradicate error, human error, as much as physically possible. And at the moment, obviously we go through the processes of looking at criticality, you know, we, we've got processes by which you can feedback and say, look, if this is a poorly designed process, it takes a lot of training. And a lot of training is not a benefit. It just means your process is crap and people have got to know a lot to operate this thing. And if there's a lot to know, there's a lot to forget and people are going to make mistakes. So can you can you make it better so we have to train them less? Because if you don't, you're going to get downstream errors. So we're kind of already going through that, that process and have been for a number of years. The bit that fascinates me, I kind of it's rolling around in my head and I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I'm doing a lot of studying on it, is, is human factors. So what are, the, what are the reasons that people make mistakes? How do you categorize them? And how do you factor that into analysis of saying, this looks like a combination of those factors. This is why you're making the error here. And this is how it should influence what you're doing to reduce error to the, to the minimum amount possible. And it then bleeds into kind of Six Sigma. You know, I've done my, my, my um, Six Sigma qualifications, I've done my project management ones. And again, it's about how do you get a team together to focus on reducing human error as quickly as possible with the most imp impactful minimum viable product that you can release. And that for me is kind of, you know, if you can kind of figure that out, you're in a great place and we're already doing portions, but it's the human error element that I'm absolutely obsessed with at the moment. And, and, and it's uh, it's common in medical, which is, which is key here because it's in your health insurance, absolutely fanatical about trying to, and help people live a healthier life. So I, I like bringing in relevant processes from, from things that seem to be irrelevant, but actually it, it resonates here because a lot of doctors in the organization. But it's also prevalent in aerospace. You know, NASA have got loads of public available information about human error. And it's like, well, 
if we're seeking to eradicate human error there for going into space, like, well, why would we want to eradicate human error everywhere? Why is it not applicable? To, so how can we do that? It should be part of driving it. How does it? And it just gets your brain going. And that's kind of where my really kind of crazy pulpus um, research and self-development is going on. It's kind of on the peripheries of L&D and looking even at other professions to see what we can take from it. Very good. Thank you. So my next question is about our language, our terminology, which uh, has been known to be quite messy uh, for decades and decades. But so my question is, is there a performance improvement or learning and development term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your own spin on it? What would you have for us? Uh I, I end up sometimes being more and more careful about the grammar that I use in an organization because it it perpetuates people, people will use it again and again. So I've found myself being more deliberate, which is why it's a really good question. I think there's a couple that I would might go for if, with your permission. Please. Um, I think the first one is successful training. And I think you, 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 people will look for a binary answer. Was the training successful? And I just think it, it just shows a, a fundamental lack of understanding about the performance ecosystem. And there are so many factors that dictate whether someone can perform in their role that asking whether training is successful can, can almost be a false economy. If you look at an example, and, and the first question I would ask, and this is, this is a, a, a certainly something that I've learned over the years that I've shared with people is, if someone asked me to train something, I would always ask, if someone gets it wrong, what happens? Because if nothing, if nothing happens and you and, and you just you continue to get it wrong, training people's pointless because there's no reinforcement. Now, similarly, if that part of the ecosystem, <clears throat> excuse me, is really adept, and the minute that someone does something wrong, there's immediate feedback and they get it right, the training is irrelevant. So looking at successful training is pointless in isolation. You've got to look at the whole ecosystem. So I think there's an element of, of probably that part. And, and the fact that you know, the most successful training is no training because you haven't taken people away from their jobs. They're still able to perform. The process was designed well enough that you didn't have to instruct them in any way, shape or form. There's nothing to remember. That, that successful training, the fact I've had to train somebody is unsuccessful in the start from an organization or organizational standpoint. It took me a while to get, to get my head around. The, the second element is, and this is a pet peeve, so I'm not going to start around here. Well, I probably will, but you'll cut me off. Is someone, someone asked me for refresher training. I just, I've rolled it out before. I'm totally guilty of doing it. It's my fault. But, you know, sort of five or six years ago, it's like, no. Because again, it's back to that same point about successful training. If you have to perpetually train people on something, then all of the performance mechanisms that are in the background that happen after that aren't working because it's dissipating, people aren't doing it right, they're being permitted to not do it right, they're not getting the feedback, they're not getting support to do it right, and you'll be straight back again. It's periodic programmatic training, which is the lowest form of, of, of maturity for organizations as per as per Bursin, which I happen to subscribe to. So you get stuck in that 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 routine of we're delivering it again. The real question that you know for something about refresher training is and we also use the analogy of it's like having a house that's that's cold and the heating doesn't work and then bringing a space heater in for a few hours and saying, is it warm? Yeah, great, and then just taking the space heater out. The, the insulation, the things that keep the performance where it should be do not exist. So I always, I always worry in organizations when people talk about refresher training because there is a, it, it's demonstrating there's probably a lack of understanding about the performance ecosystem in itself and the fact that whether successful training should be measured on anything other than the fact there should be no training. I have to interject a little story here. My, uh, my hero, my mentor, the late Gary Rumler, Back in 1981, this is captured on a video uh, from Motorola. But uh, he said uh, whenever there was anything that was about re retraining people, refresher training, he said 
uh, uh, it would it would cause him some discomfort. And he told a little story about you know people being sent off for three days of training and coming out knowing exactly what they knew when they went in. So it was, you know, too often that's the band aid that's not put on the wrong wound or something. But uh, um, yeah, that's that that's a huge challenge because there is so much of that that we our clients and too often our peers default to more training on the same thing. And they're not looking at the ecosystem as you put it. Uh, but that, thank you for, for those two examples. Let me, let me shift to uh, uh, my next question, which is about the influences, uh, not from early in your career, but more lately. So you've been reading about human factors and such, but are there any other people or books or articles that you might point our audience to, um, you know, besides David James and his podcast, which I agree with, because that's a fabulous series, but, but so who might you point people to that are still influencing your thinking and your approach to all of this today? So I, I do like to read in, in the peripheries of the profession. I like to, to seek to get inspiration from outside. But there was a, a brilliant book called Make It Stick. Uh, I can't remember the author's it's some, something brown. Apologies. I'm sorry with disrespect, but it was a wonderful book. And it was it's it's talking about what we what we know to be a scientific fact about the way that people learn. I wish I'd have read that book 15 years ago because it just makes you realize how little we actually know about how people learn. And some of the principles of, of observation that you can see happening throughout history that have, have underpinned why certain approaches, for example, performance sport um, and performance consulting is better. And a great example he uses, I'm probably pulling one of the words from the book, but I would encourage you to go and read it. It was talking about a particular kind of airplane in a world war that, that required two pilots to, to pilot and it caused a huge issue because we couldn't as an army get the right um, number of planes in the air to, 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 to defend the country until they realized that the reason why you couldn't fly with two people is there was too much to remember there's too many buttons to remember and the way they got around it was they just made a checklist and suddenly one person could fly the, the plane and the war effort was completely changed because you could get so many more active and that that is just a, a classic example of everything that we're here to talk about. You don't bother training one person to do it, give them a checklist, they can do it. And there's so many books around it. There's the checklist manifesto, which showed that people in, in a medical facilities, if they followed a simple checklist, it would lower mortality rates significantly. That's another one that I would probably recommend that people would, would go and read. There's Con and Bob's book, which is which is about performance support, which was brilliant. Another one, I'll give a shout out to yourself. So the, the uh, thought flow analysis book that you released that I bought, Guy, which was which was really interesting because I think when you talk about performance support, people can be quite defensive of it and assume that it's a universal tool. It's a, it's a brilliant tool. It's a great approach, but there are elements in which not everything can always be categorised as a step. There's a way that you have to map a decision process that people go through as well. And that was an important point of my maturation to say, well, what's the step? Well, it could be one of two ways. Well, okay, well, how do you, how on earth do you decide which road to go down? Well, you've got to map out the decision process. And that for me was a really, really interesting book, um, which, which helped me. Um, yeah, I think they're probably probably the, the 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 later influences that I read through. I think the periphery stuff I'd be I'd be less inclined to recommend at the moment because I think once you get to an area of performance support where you've done it for about five or six years, you know it works, you've made a few mistakes. The way that you take it forward in an organization from that point is probably more shaped by the organization itself than it is by bringing in an external approach in. You know, you, you, you bring the skeleton into the organization of, of, of performance consulting, but all the living stuff that goes around that has to come from the environment that you're in. So don't be too precious about this process. Be adaptable enough to learn from, from the place that you're working in. Yeah, exactly. No, that's, that is so important. We, 
it's you might be able to retrofit things from the outside, but there's so much going on inside the organization that we can learn from the people doing the work and the managers and the people who design the processes and help them look for opportunities to improve it. I, there's a lot that we can learn just internally. You can look at your own quality organizations, your engineering organizations. Um, you know, you need to partner with your customers and clients and stakeholders, and uh, you can learn a lot from that. So let me wrap up here a little bit. Uh, um, uh, first of all, thanks for agreeing to do this with me. But so my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for people new to the field? What would you suggest that they th how they think about this and what they do? Oh, what did what should I have told myself? Um, I, I think there are some key questions that you could probably ask during your analysis process that could start to push you towards this kind of approach. And I think one of them we've discussed around if someone does this incorrectly now, what happens? That's going to lead you away from formal instruction and into the performance ecosystem, which I think will help. I think the other one would be imagine we can't train people. You know, you're under the gun. You've got no choice. You cannot train people. This is going now, it's going live. What could you give people to hand to ensure that they could get it right every time? If that's a departure point, for your involvement in any organization, you're going to start looking at workflow rather than instruction. Now, it's not to the crown and say there's no place for instruction. Of course there is. But the minute you, you turn around and go, I've developed a week-long course, you've got to start asking questions to say, number one, the commercial viability of how much people are going to remember. Also, the capacity for human error, if there's five hours worth of instruction to remember, people are going to get a lot of stuff wrong. So rather than assuming that that's your only interaction with an individual, remember that they're going to walk out that door, they're going to have a weekend, they're going to get 60% of it, and they're going to start work on the Monday, and what are you left with? Life has gotten in the way because we're all humans. If that is your focus when you start any consultation, and maybe you go looking for the resources before you even design anything. I think it will start to push you in, in, in the right direction and you'll start to think less entrenched about design of, of, of instruction and thinking more about ergonomics. If I were going to look for something, where would I look? Well, put it there then. You know, don't give someone a... 60 page manual and send them on the way because you'll find it in the bin on the way out you're going to look for something where are you going to be you know those sort of thought processes about considering workflow analysis much rather than instruction are all going to help you slowly sort of pick apart and go okay i need to find what works for me or i need to find what works for this organization i think that is a, a rather long-winded version of the the potted advice i'd give myself a number of years ago Thank you for that. Seb, again, thanks so much for doing this and uh, you have a great day. You too. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.